during the early days of the pandemic and the more stringent phases of lockdown, how it must have shifted the way that I went through to time and sleep. I felt my body come awake, one ear to the ground like a shell to the sea. I was drawn to explore more deeply the human relationship to death in different cultures, in the mythology and folklore of earlier ages and how it might have evolved over time. This poem is an invitation to two Greek gods, Hypnos, sleep, and his brother Thanatos, death. These two dark sons of night are described in Hesiod's Theogony as awful gods, exiled to a far-flung cave, source of the Lethe, the river of forgetfulness, where no light or sound ever reached them. This poem is an attempt to invite these exiled child gods back into our pantheon, to honour the place they hold in our lives and not lose sight of how the miraculous continues to envelop us as we sleep wake in the hand of one sun night. Hymn to the Twins of Nyx and Erebus When it arrived, I could not sleep turned with space so far from me and I called out my dreams him there in his darkened cave by the river of forgetting I begged that calm and gentle God would find me kiss my eyes shut with his hands Cover me quickly. When he came, when he changed us and everything, we lost all sense of time and space seemed elastic, shrinking into vastness. I thought of you then, how I would give half of my life for you, how you would, when neither rays nor waves touch, be resting on blackened bark, a twilight in the gloom, stitched together in the shadows in the woods, but sleep Melancholy, you are not alone, for death is always somebody's brother, gentle you, with feather-like fingers, waltzing on the sea's broad back. Hello everybody, I'm Marina Cassidy and I'm going to sing a song for you uh, by Sandy Denny and the Fairport Convention Band and this is a song called Who Knows Where the Time Goes.
Hello, I'm John W. Sexton. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be taking part in Amagon Online. Hopefully later on in the year we'll be able to meet in the flesh. I'm coming to you today from my home on Corran, the highest mountain in the Caja range of the Berra Peninsula, on the Kerry side, overlooking the bay where Amagon and Skana entered into the country. I'm going to read for you today two poems from my most recent collection, Visions at Temple Glanton. The poems come from the title sequence and are uh, individually untitled, so I'll be leaving a few moments between each poem. A terrible tearing, like a fathomless grief, descends overhead. You wake to it. The noise is continuous, without break, pouring from the night sky. You dress quickly and go outside. The sky is cloudless and full of stars, and the noise is coming from each of those bright, brittle points in the night. A thudding in the grass startles you, and you look down. A hare is surveying you. It bolts away, but not too far before stopping. It turns and looks again. You see a young boy. It's you, the ghost of something you were. The boy has a jagged stone in his hands, and he throws this viciously. At the hare, the hare drops to the ground. The boy is gone. There is only you, the loss of a stone suddenly in your hand. You look at the hare, but that is gone too. In its place, in a heap, is an old woman. You recognise her. She is your grandmother. She is lifeless, her skin grey under starlight, her clothes the same. You pick her up, and she is as light as a bundle of dry sticks. A flash illuminates the meadow. Forty yards distant, thirty-five yards distant, thirty yards, twenty-five yards, a blue sheet of lightning is approaching. You walk to meet it with your lifeless grandmother in your arms. You know that lightning is an invigorant to hares, but they frolic in it. You know instinctively that the lightning can revive her. The sheet of light is now upon you. Grandmother falls to pieces in your grasp. A hare is suddenly thudding away through the meadow. You are a light, full of a fathomless grief. You are a bright, brittle point in the night. 
blue, becomes white, becomes blue, becomes white, becomes blue, becomes white, becomes. A zinc bath is resting on the table and your mother is kneading filthy sheets through the soapy water. The water is black from the sheets and your mother is singing the song of washing night from the bed. You cannot see any of this nor hear it. You are just a lump of nothing in her womb, just a bud of something to come. But the sheets are clear in your mindless mind. You can see the black water through your eyeless eyes. Your mother is rinsing the sheets now, pouring fresh water into the bath. She twists and twists the sheets, knotting them into themselves, squeezing them free of the night. She's out behind the house now, at the washing line. There's a hint of soot on the thatch. Or is it the night still clinging there? She lifts out a sheet, but this one is round. She hefts it over the washing line. Through your eyeless eyes you can see a pale, upside-down face on the sheet. That's the moon she's been washing. She's washed the night clean out of the moon and is hanging it there in the sunlight. The moon hangs there, hangs halved over itself. The night is a while away yet, but where you are, the night is already settled, already settled around you. Thank you. Do you have a paddy bush and so a cur clausor lishan sra lehevena so amergan steps online agus lishan no chus cur eiger eig len hele of ulimid ashamach. Paddy bush here is putting an end to this series, Amergan Steps Online, with the hope, uh, without the certainty, but in the hope that it is face to face in person we we'll meet uh, the next time i'd like to thank the readers the uh, musicians singers whose generosity with their time and work has made this series possible and i'd particularly like to thank alison driscoll whose quiet efficiency uh, put the whole thing together and organize it. Uh, thank you, Alison, on all our behalf. I'd also like uh, to read a poem called Amergan's Ship for Holger Lunsa. Holger, who with Karen, since they came here five years ago, have added so much to the um, cultural and artistic life of Ira. Some of you will be familiar with the wonderful monument or Hortana, which is a monument to Amergan and the Miletians, which stands on the seafront at Waterville, uh, about uh, six metres high. This is a maquette made of the monument, made by Holger. You see, it's a wonderful piece in bronze, the sea becoming the planking, the prow of the ship, which is also the nomen of a sundial, which is like a compass needle pointing north as it does, uh, which is the direction the Miletians would have sailed in when they left uh, Galicia. And here, lovely touches like here being the eye of a gannet, which are so much part of the ocean around here. And it, it's altogether a very wonderful piece. This is a poem I wrote about it. Amergan's Ship for Holger Lunsa. Because he wanted simply to be as one 
with the swelling wave and the wind, with the salmon and with the stars clustered in the eye of the gannet. He sailed north when the four winds blossomed together in a compass, north being the petal that trembled towards the grey ambiguous headlands the elder swore he scried from the tower infinitely far beyond the salty horizon. The ship's skin-lined planking breathed brine and wind, welded gust and swell in a coupling that surpassed navigation. Sea and ship hammered one another into one another's shape, shaped wind and weather to the poet's will to be the voyage, to be the landfall, and the words that marked the landfall, to be the land and the land's creatures, to be the stones raised in commemoration, to be the ship beached forever on the land, and the words singing themselves into bronze. As I said, I hope the next time we meet, will be in person at the monument of which this is a maquette, August Gudishin Gudeshiv Erfada Erfad Slan, August Slant and Vradan Koiv Erfad.